Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to speak. It's a great pleasure to be back in Montreal. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about distortion in hyperbolic groups. And um, the project that I'm going to be talking about today is joint with Tim Riley. So I'm going to start with um, defining what I mean by distortion or subgroup distortion. So um, let's say you have a finitely generated group G with a finite generating set S. Then uh, you can define a notion of lengths of elements of G. And so if you look at uh, an element little g in the group, then um, its length is just the shortest length of a word in the generators, which represents that element. Um, of course, this is nothing but the distance of g to the identity in the word metric of the group, if you're familiar with that. Um, OK, well, now if you take a finitely generated subgroup uh, and take some generating set for it, then there are two different possible distances that you can have on this subgroup. So um, just, you know, let's say your subgroup is sitting inside G in this weird way. So uh, that's the subgroup. You know, if you look at a point here and a point here, then go, being forced to go around in H is much longer than going straight across in G. So the lengths of these, uh, the intrinsic length of H might differ from the metric that you get on it induced by the ambient metric of G. And so the distortion function is something that quantifies um, how bad this difference is. So to uh, so it's a function on n. So to compute uh, its value for a number n, what you do is you look at all possible um, all possible elements of H whose length in G is at most n. So schematically, what you're doing is you, know, you look at the ball of radius n in G, and then, you know, um, H is sitting inside here somehow. Maybe here's the identity. And so you're looking at all of the things that are in this intersection, the intersection of the ball of radius n and G and H. And then for each one of them, you're going to look at, you know, what's the difference between, what's, what's the distance to the identity and taking the maximum over all of these. So uh, sort of uh, encoding the worst possible behavior among um, all of these elements whose length in G is at most N. Okay, so you may have noticed that I did not write an S here. I just wrote a G here. And the reason I can do that is that um, it doesn't really matter. So this distortion function is independent of the generating sets that you choose for your subgroups up to this standard equivalence that we use in geometric group theory called coarse by Lipschitz equivalence. Um, since we haven't seen this before in this conference, I wrote down the definition, but um, basically it's, an, it's a way of saying when two things are two functions are equivalent is um, if they're asymptotic in this specific way. Um, and so for this talk, all you really need to know is sort of some specific um, properties. So for example, um, if you choose any number bigger than one, then um, say lambda, then lambda to the n is actually equivalent to two to the n. So all exp exponential functions are equivalent as long as the base is at least uh, one. And um, if you take two numbers, alpha and beta, bigger than or equal to one, then n to the alpha is equivalent to n to the beta, if and only if alpha is equal to beta. And by the same reasoning, um, two to the n to the alpha is equivalent to two to the n to the beta, if and only if alpha is equal to beta. And so one useful property is that if you take a function that's less than another function in this, in this way, then um, basically the bigger one just dominates. So you can just kind of ignore this F and F plus G is just, ah, no, sorry, equivalent to this. Okay, so, um, right. And so for instance, you know, N plus N to the fifth or something is just equivalent to N to the fifth. And, um, 
But on the other hand, if I do like n to the fifth plus two to the n or something, then that would be equivalent to two to the n. So the bigger thing just dominates. Okay. And um, oh, maybe I should have also said that if I do n times two to the n, then that's equivalent to two to the n. Okay. So that's just some uh, a few facts to give you a feel for how these things work. Um, okay. So before I move on to the history and the new stuff, I want to just do some very simple examples of computation of a distortion function. So here we have a group, um, G1, I'm calling this G1, uh, but this is the um, Baumslug solitar group. So I think it's often denoted by BS. And I'm gonna, it might actually be helpful if I call this BSAT, because I'm later gonna talk about Baumslug solitar groups with different generators. So that's some notation that's useful. And um, okay, so the, so and let's look at the subgroup generated by this A. And the question is, what is the distortion of this subgroup? So within this group, we have a picture like this, right? And so what this is encoding is just saying that if you do t to the n a or t to the minus n a t to the n, then that's the same as just a to the two to the n. And it's easy to see this, right? If you start up here, there's a first t over here, a first t inverse and another t inverse here. And the relation in the group tells us exactly that this is a a. And now you keep iterating this process. So if I do this again, then I get, and then I get two a's here and two a's here. And so by the time I've done this n times, I have two to the n a's at the bottom, okay? So what's going on here is if I choose this sequence of words, hn, um, then I have these diagrams that I have, like I have over here. And going around on this side of the diagram, I get a word that's length about n. It's actually this function of n, but because of this equivalence, I don't really care about that. I just care about the fact that it's in the order of n. And on the other hand, if I'm forced to go through the subgroup, then I have this word of length two to the n. And so this tells me, so what I've done is I've exhibited, I've exhibited a particular sequence of words, which does actually have this distortion. And so this is a lower bound on the distortion function. Now, normally this doesn't tell you, doesn't necessarily tell you what the distortion function is because to show that the distortion is actually this function, I would have to prove that for any word in this subgroup, the distortion is at most this function, which in this group, it's not very hard to do. So uh, in fact, it's true that the distortion of this subgroup is actually two to the n for this particular subgroup. And the way that you would go about doing that is, well, you say, okay, here's an arbitrary, um, chi uh, in H, and this is its path in H. And maybe there's some other thing in w, uh, w in G1, which represents the same element. And the only difference is that because this path is allowed to go into G, it has a bunch of T's and T inverses in addition. And so what you can do is you can look at, there's always gonna be some innermost um, sorry, T, T inverse pair. And what you can do is you can just replace this bit that's between the two T's with this other bit, and you can control how much longer that got. It just doubled in length at most, and uh, then keep going. So then you replace the next bit pair of T's and so on. And so you only have to do this about N times, and so that tells you that the total length of this thing at the bottom here is at most to the end. So that's the idea. Um, okay, so um, this tells us that the distortion of this subgroup generated by A in the big group is um, two to the N. And now you can go further. So uh, this is an old example of Gerson, which says, now let's take um, an extra generator S and add in the relation that S distorts T. So what this really is, is it's just the Baumslag-Solitar group on A and T that we were talking about before. 
And then we're amalgamating it with the one generated by S and T over the subgroup T, okay? And so now you can see from this picture that this behavior gets um, composed, right? So um, these two pictures, these two wings on the side show that N S's distort a T to T, two to the N T's. And then those two to the N T's then in turn distort this A to two to the two to the N A's, okay? And so again, you have these diagrams. So this gives you a family of um, words that give you your candidates for the distortion function. They give you this lower bound in the distortion function. And then by an argument uh, similar to what I was talking about on the previous slide, you can show that this is actually also an upper bound. And so this is a double exponential, okay? And so now you can clearly iterate this to get any tower of exponentials. So, um, so this would be, if, you, if I take K copies of this, so, and then I amalgamate that with, and I keep going. And if I take K copies, then I'm gonna get a tower of exponentials of height K. And um, yeah, so that's the distortion. Okay, so these are some elementary examples which show you um, how to do computations of distortion in, uh, in these groups. Okay. All right, so you might wonder, we've seen some examples, you might wonder which functions arise as um, distortion functions of groups in other groups. And a theorem of Olshansky says that in fact, pretty much anything could occur. So if you have, so, so the actual theorem says, if you take any finitely generated group H and any reasonable computable function F on H. So by reasonable, I mean, these are just some conditions that you would expect a distortion function to have. So for instance, you want F of G to be equal to F of G inverse, because that's what happens, you know, you need that for a distortion. So, so there's a couple of, a few other properties like that, but that's not very restrictive, restrictive at all. And the result and the conclusion is that there's a finitely presented group for which, uh, which you can embed H in. And this function F that you started with is exactly the restriction of the length function of G on H. So in particular, you could just start with H equal to Z, the integer is the simplest possible infinite group you could think of and make it wildly distorted in some finitely presented groups. So um, so, right, so if you're allowed to choose um, whatever G you want, then the distortion could be wild, even for a simple group like the integers. Okay, so you might think, well, maybe this is not so surprising because now, by now we're all used to the idea that if you look at all possible finitely presented groups, then you should expect things to be pretty wild. So what happens when you impose some nice geometry on, uh, on the situation? I believe the only hypothesis you mean for H, I believe the only hypothesis is finitely generated. Yeah. Um, right. And so, right. So now let's see what happens if we put some, yeah. But does equal mean equivalent? It's yeah. actually equal, I believe. Actually equal. Yes. Okay. But I did not read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. Thanks for not reading the paper, so I didn't have to not read it. <laughs> okay. So, um, right. So, what happens if, say, we restrict to cat zero groups? Um, now, cyclic subgroups at least behave nicely. So, cyclic subgroups of cat zero groups are undistorted. Um, but then that's where it ends. So it turns out that there's a res result of Olshansky and Sapir, which says that the set of functions which arise as distortion functions of subgroups of free by free groups, which are cat zero, uh, is the same as a set of Dane functions of all finitely presented groups. Um, so what are the, what's that set? Well, there's a famous theorem of Sapir, Berger, and Rips, which says that any reasonable computable function is a Dane function of a finitely presented group. So once again, we have this uh, huge um, uh, range of possibilities. Okay, so 
what about if we have hyperbolic? What if, what if the ambient group is hyperbolic rather than cat zero? Um, luckily, Chris defined hyperbolic, so I don't have to. Um, okay, so once again, cyclic subgroups are undistorted. So let's see, let's start with the nice behavior. So cyclic subgroups are undistorted. And um, there's a nice thing that happens when you pass to the hyperbolic world, which is that um, being undistorted, oh, I think I forgot to say undistorted is the same as having linear distortion. Um, so being undistorted is the same as or equivalent to being quasi-convex. This is by no means true if you sort of leave the um, hyperbolic setting. But in this setting, it's actually uh, really nice. And it's sort of a consequence of the fact that um, quasi-geodesics stay uniformly close to geodesics. Um, but even more is true. So it turns out that um, there's a gap between distortion functions of distortion functions between linear and exponential. So if you have a subgroup that is distorted, then it has to be at least exponentially distorted. Um, and so this is uh, proved by Kapovich. Okay, so, um, right, so that's pretty nice. So there's this nice gap, which we hadn't seen in uh, any of the sort of more general settings or other settings that we saw before. Um, let's see what else is true. So. Uh, now that we have this connection to quasi-convexity, we can kind of think about, um, you know, results about quasi-convexity that have been proved. So there's quite a large class of groups known to be what's called locally quasi-convex. So in other words, every finitely generated subgroup is quasi-convex. So for instance, this is true for uh, any finite rank free group by a result of short, uh, any hyperbolic surface group by a result of pitay. And sort of more generally, uh, Wise defined a notion of um, combinatorial uh, sectional curvature and proved that if you have X a non-positively curved piecewise Euclidean two complex with negative sectional curvature, then, um, then it's locally quasi-convex. So in all of these settings, every single finitely generated subgroup is going to be undistorted. Okay. So that's all good stuff. On the other hand, uh, we have the RIPS construction, which was mentioned yesterday. And so the RIPS construction gives you a way of starting with any finitely presented group Q and realizing it as a quotient of a hyperbolic group G. So it's hyperbolic, therefore finitely presented, um, such that the kernel is a finitely generated subgroup. And so uh, what possible distortions could this kernel have? Well, there's a theorem of Silla which says that if you start with a group with unsolvable word problem, um, then the distortion function is not bounded above by a recursive function. So it could at least, these distortion functions could at least get arbitrarily high. Um, but notice that by an observation of Beery, it turns out that um, this group is not going to be finitely presented most of the time. So it is finitely generated, but it's not typically going to be finitely presented. Um, so it's not going to be finitely presented if Q is finite, unless Q is finite. Um, okay, so this gives you um, lots of, this gives you lots of potential examples of distorted subgroups of hyperbolic groups, but they're mostly not going to be finitely presented subgroup. Okay, so to summarize, here's some questions that come up when you consider the things that we've discussed so far. So we saw that there was a gap in the distortion spectrum. So you might wonder, are there other gaps in this distortion spectrum? Um, and then, you know, when considering the question of which functions occur as distortion functions, you might consider uh, what happens when you impose different kinds of finiteness conditions. So for example, what if you allow all finitely generated subgroups or you allow only finitely presented subgroups or look at just the nicest possible finitely presented subgroups, namely free subgroups. Um, and for the rest of the talk, all of the examples that I'm gonna mention are all going to be examples of free subgroups, which are distorted. Okay, so, um, Continuing along the history, uh, so there exist pairs of, so remember, we already said that the distortion has to be at least exponential. And 
this result says that there exists pairs F and G. So F is a free group and G uh, is either hyperbolic by a construction of Mahan and or cat minus one by a later construction by Bernard, Brady and me. Um, and the distortion is a tower of exponentials um, x to the kn. And so um, this is kind of a ripsification of the um, Gersten examples that I was talking about in the beginning of my talk. So Gersten, construction, Gersten constructed a tower, you know, these towers of Baumschlag solitar groups, which gave these towers of exponentials as distortion. And now we sort of um, hyperbolize them. Okay, and then Gerstner also has another one which gives a function that's higher than any tower of exponentials. So this is a function f n, where the value of f at n is x to the n of one. So it's just a tower of e's of height n. Um, and there's a way of uh, sort of modifying that um, that Gerstner construction to get a distortion function um, equivalent to this function fn, and then you hyperbolize it and then get the corresponding hyperbolic groups with the same property. Okay, so this is a pretty large function. Do all your big groups split over C, like the... Uh, no, uh, they they're multiple H and N extensions, but they're not, but they're not uh, free by cyclic or uh -huh. they're not even... Um, yeah, so they're not amalgamated products of free by cyclic groups. Um, and then um, Brady, uh, Brady, Dyson, and Riley produced even larger distortion functions. So um, the, they produced a sequence of groups FK and GK. Again, FK is free. And the distortion of FK and GK is the kth Ackerman function. And this is a sequence of recursively defined functions, which each grows much faster than the previous one. And so the second one is just a simple exponential. And the third one is already the one that grows faster than any exponential. And then the fourth one grows even faster than that and so on. So, so right. So this is a huge, uh, again, a class of groups where the distortion grows uh, very, very quickly. And this was the state of affairs when, uh, when, when, when we started this project that I'm gonna mainly spend my time talking about. Um, and so we were motivated by this question. So, you know, we saw earlier that there's a gap in distortion functions between linear and exponential. And so the question is what happens between exponential and double exponential? And the reason this is sort of interesting is, um, as we mentioned before, a common way to construct these examples is by taking amalgamated products in such a way that your distortion functions compose. But in this case, there's nothing with, there's no hyperbolic group with polynomial distortion. And so you can't use it to, you know, do a simple thing where you just com uh, combine two of them and have the um, distortions compose just like in the tower of exponentials example. And so this is our result. So we, we we're able to construct such groups. And so the result is given integers P bigger than Q, bigger than or equal to one, there's a pair of groups H and G such that H is free, G is hyperbolic, and the distortion of H and G is two to the n to the P over Q. So it, so it shows that there isn't a gap in the sense um, that I mentioned before between exponential and double exponential. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. Okay. Maybe. It's not the same type of gap. I think everybody can agree on that. Okay. Um, right. So, um, all right. Moreover, C can be made C prime one six. So Macarena talked about C prime one six yesterday uh, or uniformly C prime one six, which just means that 
every piece is smaller than one sixth of the smallest relator, not just the relator that it's sitting inside. Um, and this uniform C prime one six condition implies that you can put a cat minus one structure on it. So this is the result of Brown. And then um, if you take just C prime one six, then Y's prove that uh, those groups are accumulated or co-compactly. I guess that was one of Macarena's exercises to figure out who proved that. Um, and then by the theorem of Eagle that Daniel Groves mentioned yesterday, we get virtually special. And the fact that virtually special implies residually finite just comes from the fact that virtually special implies linear and that's for linear groups. So yeah, so um, all these properties just follow by quoting um, various people's results. Okay, so for the remainder of the talk, I want to give you an idea of what this construction actually is. Um, okay, so like I said, you know, our standard trick of constructing examples by just amalgamating things doesn't work. So we have to kind of take a step back and do what the other people did in the first place. So take some non-hyperbolic group in which the behavior that we care about exists and then hyperbolize it. Okay, so what we want to do is in a non-hyperbolic non group, we want to construct a diagram of this form. Now, what is this form? I need to write some stuff to say what I mean. So the length, the pink that I'm going to do right here is the length of things. Uh, we're going to actually put group elements on it later. But I want a diagram in which the lengths of things look like this. And then down here, I'm going to have two to the n to the p. OK, so this pink thing down here is going to be an element of my free subgroup that's distorted. And so you should interpret this diagram just like the other diagrams that I was drawing before. So going around the outside of this word, what do I see? I see a word that's so. The, uh, the boundary of this thing has length about n to the q, because that's the dominating term, versus 2 to the n to the p. So 2 to the n to the p as a function of n to the q is 2 to the n to the p over q. So, uh, so, so this is the diagram that I want. Uh, the question is, how do we produce this diagram? Okay, and so to so to do so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I interchanged them. So this this is a one, and this is an n. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And that's an n to the q. Okay. So how do we get this? Well, we look at a free group. So this is a free group on the generators B0 to BP. Uh, and then take a free bicyclic group that it, that's, that it sits inside, uh, where this element A acts by this particular automorphism. So uh, B0 goes to B1, B0, B1 goes to B2, B1, and so on. And then at the end, you have this different thing. So BP just goes to BP. So this is a particular explicit automorphism. and it is an automorphism whose growth is n to the p. And it's not too hard to see that. So you get a picture that looks like this, which is not exactly what uh, the rectangle that I had in the previous slide, but it's getting there. Uh, to be more precise, it's not too hard to see that, you know, if you start with b0 over here and a over here, uh, a to the n over here, and a to the n over here, then this is some word in the b's. And in fact, you have one B0, N B1s, and then not exactly N squared B1s, but something equivalent to N squared uh, B2s. Da, 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 da. And then about N to the P 
BQs. Uh, if you don't believe me, then hopefully this picture will convince you of that, or maybe not, I don't know. So um, this is a picture where you've got um, five A1s or A's, uh, one B0. So in the first step, what happens is that the B0 splits into a one and a zero. Then we get a one and a, sorry, uh, two, one, one, zero, and so on. So it propagates. So by the end, I still have just this one B0 and then five B1s and, and so on. Okay. So, so this is sort of what the picture looks like just in this setting. Okay, now remember this. Rem remember that what I really wanted was, um, whoop, I meant to go back. Okay, what I really wanted was a picture that looks like this, except I wanted, instead of n, I wanted an n, n to the power q here. So how am I gonna get that? Well, no, remember that we said that over here, if I start with b0, a to the n, then over here, I get n to the q bqs. And what I can do is I can introduce a new relation. So this is the old, minus the blue, this is the old relation that produced this bq. And then I'm just gonna add this extra a2 to it. So what does that look like in my diagram? This is very big, but needs to be this big for me to actually write this stuff. And in the old presentation, I would just have an A on the last edge. Now I'm gonna subdivide, or an A1. Now I'm gonna subdivide and put an A2 here. But now this A2 needs somewhere to go. So I need to put in these relations which say that A2 commutes with all of the, B, all of the Bs. And if I do that, then I can sort of push it down here with commuting relations. And so it shows up at the bottom here. So each time a BQ is produced, when we flow that way, we get an A2 being produced, which flows down. So this is sort of shown in this picture. So remember in this picture, we had zero one, and then this is still a zero one, but here we have a one two. And um, that means that in this example, if we take Q equal to two, then whenever a B, B2 is produced, we should also produce an A2. So this is gonna produce an A2 here, and that A2 is gonna flow down past these things. And so in this particular example, um, there's all these various places where A2s get produced and they flow down. Okay, so we've got the original rectangle that I wanted to start with, which is uh, in the general case, we have, um, you know, this length is about n to the q, uh, n to the p, and this length is about n to the q coming mostly from the A2s. Great, so we've got this diagram. What should we do with it? Put it together with a Baumslag solitar type thing, which takes some X and the Bs blow up the Xs just like in the Baumslag solitar. So I have this, so I now have put this thing inside a group where this diagram is possible. And this diagram has the right lengths, meaning that this is two to the n to the p, and this is n to the q. So it's the right function. Um, but it's not hyperbolic, right? So we still need to make it hyperbolic. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, there's sort of a standard trick, which is just cut it open. So this is what rips does, right? Just cut it open and introduce a huge long rips word, right? It's a small cancellation word. Um, uh, and the point is that these, 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 what we call noise words are chosen so that they satisfy the C prime one six condition. Okay, but now we've introduced this 
again, just like the A2s, when we introduce this thing, we have to make sure it has somewhere to go inside our diagram, right? And so we have to, again, allow these things to flow down out of the diagram, which means we need to introduce more relations which allow our, um, our new words that we just introduced to commute past these Bs. But they can't actually commute because this is a hyperbolic group. And so when you move Bs past noise, it creates even more noise. And so these things kind of just keep expanding. But we can control exactly how much noise is created. OK, so putting everything together, we get this. But now we have a problem, which is my lengths are messed up again. This used to be n to the q, but now I introduced all this junk. And so it's not, it's exponential. So it doesn't give me the right uh, function anymore. So let's just do the obvious thing that we can think of, which is, well, it was the A's that were creating the N to the Q. So let's just move them all to one side and move everything else to the other side. So um, it seems crazy because at each step, we're just doing kind of the obvious thing that, we, that you might think of and it's all gonna work out in the end. Okay, so, um, all right. So we introduced some extra relations which make the noise flow by. And so we put everything together and now we're happy again. Um, here's our word. Moving the noise past didn't actually blow up the distorted word by very much. So I still have this thing which has length two to the end of the P. And now I'm happy again because going around the outside is, to, is N to the Q. It's the right, right function. Um, so great, right? This should be what I got. This should be the group, but not quite because it turns out that, remember how I said that just because you have one family of words that attains the function that you want doesn't mean that it's the distortion function. There could be some totally other diagrams which give you even worse distortion. And that happens in this case. Uh, that happens if you, instead of starting with B0 here, you start with something which is really high, like BQ. If you start with BQ, then all those extra A's which were giving us the, this end of the Q never materialize. And so you just get, you know, the simple exponential function. Okay. So again, you kind of do the thing which really shouldn't work, but does, which is you use two kinds of noise. Okay, so there's blue noise, which interacts with B's, and there's red noise, which interacts with A's, and B0 converts blue to red. Okay, so it's a very simple idea, but it's amazingly just works. So the point is that like the particular diagrams that I was talking about over here, the bad ones, which give you this, those involve, those don't have any B0s. So there's nothing to convert blue to red. And so they don't give you any distortion diagrams anymore. Okay, so that's the group. And here's the presentation for the group. Um, so this looks a little bit intimidating, but it's just what we were talking about, right? So this first row is the relations coming from the original free bicyclic group, right? It's just the free group automorphism that we had. And then um, then, then the sort of small cancellation words added in. The second row is, well, we had to add the A2 and then the A2 needs somewhere to go. So the second row just tells you how A2s move past Bs. And then the next two rows, there's the blue noise rows and the red noise rows. So it's all just exactly what we talked about, but all put in one. Um, and this is, yeah, so this is the reason that this had to be a slide talk. Um, okay. So um, there's one extra feature that I hasn't really come up yet, which is that there's this extra noise letter T, which we strategically introduce. And what we do is we 
make sure that every one of these small cancellation word has words has one T and one T inverse, except if it's one of these ones where already there's a T, in which case there's just a T pointing in the other direction. And this is a trick that we picked up from a paper of Donnie Wise's where he does a residually finite version of the RIPS construction. Um, and so actually using Donnie's criterion, we can just show directly that this is residually finite um, without appealing to virtually special. But more importantly, so the way, notice that there's exactly two oppositely oriented T's in each word. Um, oh, before I say that, let me just say that, so what's the distorted subgroup? It's just the red noise, Y1, Y2, and T, okay. There's only, there's exactly two T's in all of the, um, in, in, in each uh, relation. And that means that we get an H and N structure with stable letter T. I mean, there's something to check there, but, and somehow this gives us a way to control the diagrams that show up when you consider distortion functions. And so it, it sort of gives an added layer of rigidity to the diagrams that we consider which I probably won't say too much about. There's a second H&N structure, which, um, or a multiple H&N structure, which starts with all of the noise and then just successively adds the A's and the B's. And this is useful because um, it's a very easy way, for instance, to see that the distorted subgroup is free because the original middle group that we started with here is a free group on the noise letters, and that embeds in successive H and N extensions. So it's still free uh, in the big group. Okay. Um, all right, so, so that's the group. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to say a little bit about the proof. Um, we already have our lower bound diagram. So we've already established that the distortion function is at least, two to the end of the P over Q. We wanna show that it's exactly to the P, end of the P over Q. Okay, so we wanna start with some chi, some word chi, which is inside the subgroup. And we want to take some W. So this, this is in the subgroup. Uh, in the subgroup, but what I mean is it's actually sitting inside the subgroup, the whole path. And um, this is a word in G, which represents the same element. And so we get this Van Kampen diagram, which we refer to as distortion diagram. So what we want to show is that the length of this element is exactly two to the n to the p over q. Okay, and we may as well assume that chi is maximal. By which I mean, among all of the words, um, among all of the words chi, which represent length n or less elements of G, chi has the maximal length. Okay, so it's one that attains the distortion function. And we can assume that W is minimal in the sense that it's the shortest word it's the shortest word that is equal to chi in G. And we can assume that this diagram is reduced. So this is a Van Kampen diagram and reduced just means that it doesn't have any cells which could be folded. Okay, so we wanna analyze such diagrams. And a typical thing that one does when thinking about Van Kampen diagrams is to consider corridors. So uh, supposing you have a relation uh, supposing you have the property, a generator in your group, such as the T's, which occurs exactly twice in each relation with opposite orientation, then you can that allows you to sort of con start constructing corridors in your Van Kampen diagram. And so you start at one, gener one rela relation cell, and then you pass to the next one, and there's exactly one other place where you can go out and so on, right? So that's a corridor, a T corridor in this case. 
Um, so typically what you do is you look at the, you know, some Van Kampen diagram, and then you start looking at corridors and they either do something like this. So this transverse direction is T, or maybe they look, they close in on themselves and form an annulus. And then you try to kind of get rid of these annuli and do something with the remaining corridors. That's kind of the standard mode of operation when you're talking about these. Um, we have a slight problem, which is that we really need to control these bees and the bees sort of appear in cells which look like this. So there's bi and then bi plus one, bi. Uh, so notice that there's only one bi plus one in this cell and that's gonna seriously hinder sa standard corridor type arguments. And so what we do instead is we consider what we call tracks. So a track, in the case of a corridor, a single corridor, a track is just sort of this curve that's in the middle of it. So similar to a hyperplane in a cube complex, right? In a two-dimensional cube complex. But then something different happens in these cells. So here we want to, it, when, when you enter this cell, there are two ways to go out. And we sort of allow both of them. And we have a smoothness condition, which says that if you're traveling in the direction where the orientations are preserved, it's smooth, such as this and this, but otherwise, here where the orientation is reversed, it's not smooth, okay? And so you can see that, you know, through diagrams uh, using our presentation, this sort of just propagates into some thing that looks kind of like a train track and so on, okay? Um, okay, and so we have three types of tracks, um, T tracks, A tracks, or A1 tracks, and B tracks. So in, in the case of a B track, a track is, you know, one sort of smooth path within this big graph. And we, so by analyzing these different types of tracks in reduced diagrams, it turns out that we can prove that in these sort of worst case diagrams that we're considering, tracks behave really nicely. So let's say we have one of these worst case diagrams. Well, all T tracks are vertical, meaning they all go this way. So this is, a, this is what I was referring to earlier when I said that T tracks kind of give us some rigidity, meaning that they cause all of these noise words to flow in the direction of chi. Um, there's no B loops. So this is, and this uh, is a typical thing that one wants to uh, rule out when working with these diagrams. Um, and then the next one is really useful. So if you have an A track, or a B track that joins two endpoints, then it must be oriented towards chi. Again, this is all coming to, you know, forcing all of the bad behavior into the place where we want it to go. And, um, and then here's the best part. So we, you know, so yeah, so B track is outermost, meaning that, so, any other B track is sort of contained inside it. So if this one is a B track, uh, then it has to be a B0 track. And remember, this is really important because B0 is the thing that converts blue to red. Okay, so what do we do when we put all, the, what do we get when we put all this together? So if we consider just the Bs, then our diagram has these sort of separate little regions uh, where the whole B graph B train track graph is concentrated. And at the outer edge of all of them is a B0. And now when you start considering the A's as well, they're sort of dual to the B track structure and everything's pointing towards chi. And so we can use this to get the bounds that we need because each of these B blocks behaves quite similarly to the lower bound diagrams that I was talking about. And so um, we can use this to show that, so if, if this is Wi, then we can use that to show that this is less than or equal to um, two to the length of Wi to the P over Q because of um, 
the very restrained structure that we have now established uh, this B block has. And this actual computation, in fact, can now take place in the free bicyclic quotient that we started with. Um, and then, so, we, so, so that gives us a way to estimate all of these lengths. And so putting this together, we have an estimate for sort of this, this curve that goes around here, goes around here, which by sub additivity is just the same as this, which is the function that we care about. And then what's left in this sort of diagram that's left over here, this is just A's and noise. And the way A's move past noise is just like they do in the bounds out solid R case. So just gradually corridor by corridor um, change, um, remove A's corridor by corridor. There's a slight subtlety here, which I'm not gonna mention, but anyway, it works out in the end. And so this then that gives us that this length is also um, less than or equal to two to the length of W to the P over Q. And that's what we wanted. And I'll stop there. Do you think that there can be a difference between three subgroups and general subgroups, or do you imagine for the self construct that would take the static high, go back by this point, it's the same I I think so you could probably take any kind of quality group, take an undiscovered malnormal quality bandwidth subgroup and just do those examples on that. Well, I think he's. I've, well, I think the question was the other way. Well, I thought I I I thought your question was if you can find something in a non-free subgroup, can you do it and do a free version of it? Is that the question? Yes. No idea, but I would guess. I would guess no. I guess yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the example, you start the basis between uh, exponential and double exponential. It doesn't go so higher. Yeah, I'm 90. Yeah, we're 99 percent sure that we can do like two to the two to the two to the n to the p over q uh, in the same kind of way. Uh, but there's some details to check, so I didn't actually mention it. But yeah, but hopefully there's other functions that can be gotten with. Uh, similar ideas. Right. Yep. So do you believe in any other gap like the Um if I were to put money on it, then I would say no. <laughs> but uh I have no idea. But I mean it's kind of similar in Dane functions. Like there's only this one nice gap and then anything could happen. So, so, so what's what's the precise statement there? I mean, it's uh, so, so there's, there's something in every appendix <laughs> of the Ackerman hierarchy. Right, yeah. And this closes the first gap, is that right? I mean, you're um, not exactly. That hierarchy is... Um, and so for example, between, uh, between finite, I mean, iterated exponentials and the tower, are there other things that, I mean, yeah, so I don't know about that. I don't know about that gap. Another question for Valerie. Otherwise, I remember that the picture at 1 p.m. and it's time is preparing. <laughs>